Hey, welcome again to Discovery. How many excited to be here, huh? Man, I'm stoked that you guys are here as well. I want to just take a moment before we jump into this message today and give you the announcement one more time because uh, usually I have to share something maybe three, four times before it sinks in to 50% of you. So, hey, eight-year anniversary, anniversary service is coming up September 12th, you guys, September 12th. We're eight years old or we're going to be eight years old and it's just so amazing what God has done in eight years, and I'm so excited, man, about what we're getting ready to do and what God is getting ready to do. So we wanna put on your radar because as you can see, these two morning services are packed, man, and we need to make room for what God is doing. We're in a season of harvest, man, where so many people, they're just, for whatever reason, I think it has to do with maybe the, the, the climate of our world, the pressures of our world. People realize they've always needed Jesus, but they realize it now probably more than ever. So we're in a season of harvest where so many people are committing their life to Christ and trying out church and being drawn to discovery. And so we have people that are coming to this service and even our morning service, and they like can't find a parking spot or they, they come in and they can't find a seat. And sometimes they'll even, they'll even leave. And I know that's, that sucks, but that's, it's a good problem to have but it is a problem for us to respond to. And, and, and this, this, by the way, is, is an uncomfortable problem for those of us who call Discovery home because, I mean, I, we get comfortable in our service. This is my service. You wake up at the same time. You get your coffee at this time, and I get here. And it's like it's disrupting your norm. But how many of you guys know we have to become less so Jesus can be greater? Amen? So it's not, it's not about us. It's about him and what he cares about. And what he cares about are his lost sons and daughters that still need to hear this gospel, still need to get connected to a life-giving, authentic community that can help them in their walk with Jesus. And so God is bringing people and we just need to make room. So we're going to four services on September 12th. So I had so many emails and, and, and you know, text messages and we've got social media, like everyone, some of you guys were probably, I'm not, I'm not calling you out or anything, but there was a lot of questions like, is that today? And some people even came today at 8 a.m. And so, so here, September 12th, we're moving to four services. So, so next Sunday, is next Sunday September 12th? No, no it's not. It's, it's September. So the Sunday after that is our eight-year anniversary. And that's when we'll go to four services. And this service time is going to change. You're going to have to make a decision. It's 8, 9, 45, 11, 30, and 6, 30. So most of you, if you're going to come back in a couple of weeks on the 12th, you're either going to come to the 8 or the 9, 45, or the 11th. In fact, yeah, some of you who really love Jesus will come to the 8th. Only those that love, love Jesus really will come to the 8th. So, so um, let me, I just want to kind of do a little poll with you guys. Just see who loves, no, I'm just kidding. Just see where, where you would like to. And this is like unofficial. I know you need to kind of consider it and every morning might be different. But if you were just given like, hey, you know, September 12th is here. You got to come to the 945 or the 1130. Show of hands, who's coming to 945, 945, 945. Show of hands, show of hands. Okay, who's coming to the 11:30? Show of hands, show of hands, show of hands. More of you. That's amazing. That's good. That's good. It was almost. It was a little bit split. A little bit more of the 11:30, which is great. See, that's what we want to do. We're trying to. We're trying to split it up naturally a little bit so that we make rooms, get more seats, get more parking spots, so God can continue to change people's lives. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm excited about that. Now remember. Not next week. It's the week after that anniversary service. We're still in James. We're in James. Yes, we're still in James. I, I, that's another message I'll get. I'll be getting, is it still James? Yes, we're still in James. This is week number eight of James. We've been studying James for eight weeks, and we will still be in. We're going to be concluding James next Sunday with part nine. So today, like, like again, James chapter eight, we're, or not chapter eight, uh, James, there's only five chapters. James part eight. We are closing out chapter four and beginning chapter five. So this is like literally the, the, the end. This is James final words, the final remarks. This is, these are important things. Remember, James has like a pastor's heart. There's scattered believers all over. This is why, again, it's relevant to us today and I believe very applicable because there is a lot of scattering, scattered believers for persecution, distractions were rampant because their norms got disrupted. And so James is writing a very forward, a very sometimes like Pastor Nick said, it ain't me coming at you, punching you in the gut. It's James, okay? James did it, not me. And he's got more of that today. He's gonna, and he's coming very like real in, in some hard truths, bringing, bringing believers back to some of these 
disciplines back to some like central you know getting god back in their life to where maybe it used to be and here calling them calling them back and that's why it's very relevant to us today but as we end out this last couple of messages and um the chapter there's an important topic james touches on and here's james chapter 5 verse 8 right there kind of in the middle of it all is kind of the theme of this section of james let me read it to you and i'll tell you where we're going he says you too be patient and stand firm someone say stand firm man do we need that when the world is shaken right things are uncertain around us we need to stand firm how do we do that you recognize this that the Lord's coming is near. So, so the title of today's um, message, and honestly, this entire section is about this. The, the title today is um, Live Like the Lord is Returning. So, so how would your like look, life look if you actually live this way. And again, James is going, look, man, you guys used to live this way, but you've kind of gotten distracted. You got comfortable, you got complacent. You're just living in a way that doesn't really look like you're anticipating the return of Jesus. Now, I do understand every generation believe that, hey, Jesus was gonna come back in this generation. I get that. I do, I believe like, that, that we are living in the end times. I do believe that, okay? I think nothing, like within prophetically in the scriptures, as we see what God is doing prophetically, as we see what's happening with Israel and some of the prophecies of end times, I see like we're living in the end times where Jesus can come back. But even if, this is what James is saying, even if you don't believe Jesus coming back, it's still better to live this way. To live as if the Lord is returning is, is a better way to live. It's actually how we as disciples of Jesus were meant to live, that it, within us, the spirit that was, is deposited within us yearns and groans for the return of our master, our savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. It, it's groaning, he's groaning within us to anticipate the day that we are reunited with our savior and put on perfection once and for all. So, you, you need to know, like, God is coming back one day. Jesus is coming back, and he's going to settle all the accounts. He's going to set the record straight when he comes back. There's going to be a final exam. There's going to be like a final life exam. There's going to be a life audit <laughs> when Jesus returns. And it's not going to be like your IRS audit. It's going to be a God audit. You know the difference between an IRS audit and a God audit? The God audit, you don't need to bring anything, no documents with you. It is already recorded. He has everything already. He's, he already has all the information. He, he knows what you said. He knows what you did. He knows what you thought. He knows every, the way you use your time, the way you use your money. Like he knows it all already. Romans chapter 14, verse 12 says it like this. Each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. See, God made an investment into you and he is, so he's giving you certain gifts, certain abilities, certain resources. He's giving you time and opportunity for a lot of us in this, like in this side of the, con in the world, he's given us like freedoms that other people don't have. He's giving you heritage. A lot of people, a lot of you have heritage that other people don't have. Like, like a lot of us, we have what we have and know what we know because of not anything that we've done, but what was passed down to us or given to us or instructed to us. Like there's so many blessings that we have. And God's, God says, look, I'm the one who gave you all that. And one day I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna say something like this. What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do? Now, for some of you, for some of you are on, on this side and you're like, yes, come on. When is he coming back? Like, I'm ready for that. And others of you are like, oh, dang. This message scares me, Jason. Like for some of you, some of you are scared of a message like this. To live like the Lord is returning is a fearful thing for you to do because, because there are things that you know you're not doing because you're not living that way. For those of you that like you're anticipating that you're living as if it's coming, you're excited about the master coming and being reunited with him one day. James says, uh, one day God's gonna come and say, what did you do with what I gave you? And, and I'm telling you, if we live this way, if, you, if we all live like the Lord was returning, our life would be so, it would be changed. It would be, it would be different. We'd live different. Our faith would be different. Every area of our life would be different if we lived this way, like Jesus could return at any moment. And so James, in this section of scripture, he just gives us three ways that if we lived different, if we lived like the Lord was returning in these three areas, 
then, then your life, I would even say not only like just if you did all of them, amazing, like your life is gonna like change. But honestly, if you just chose one of these areas today that the Lord is speaking to you, one of these, it's just, it's, it's a bigger burden for you to align your life. One of these areas, if you change just one, your life would change forever. And let me, so let me give them to you and then we're gonna teach it. I'm just gonna give it to you first though. James says the three areas are the way you use your time, the way you use your treasures, and the way you manage your problems, your troubles. Your time, your treasure, and your trouble. If you lived like the Lord was returning and how you used your time. If you live like the Lord was returning and how you leverage your treasures. And if you live like the Lord was returning and how you manage your troubles, oh my goodness, your life would be changed forever from this day forward. And I would challenge you with that. Today that I believe God brought you here to hear this, that the Lord is returning and there's areas of your life that need to be brought back into alignment. And maybe it is all three, but I would just, I would, I'd like to simplify it with you and just go, maybe it's just, maybe God wants you to focus on this one area first. Maybe it's just one of these areas that need to come into alignment because the Lord is returning. So let's study that together. And by the way, in this study, I like, uh, I'm just breaking down the scripture. Every one of my points is just James, it's just the scripture, that's it. So I, like, there isn't nothing like, like, oh, creative or anything. I just, I just, the, what, the points are the scripture today. That's it. So here it is. Here's what James says. Number one, our time is short, so invest it wisely. Oh my goodness, the Lord is returning. If we lived like he was returning, how many of you know we would live, we would invest our time differently? That we would use our time differently, that our time is so precious and our life is so short. It's, it's, it's every minute it counts Oh, to live that way, my goodness, to live that way, like with an understanding of every minute counts. In Ephesians chapter five, Paul, he uses this phrase. I love this phrase. He says, redeem the time. To redeem, you know what it means to redeem the time? That we are called to redeem it. It means to live in such a way that every breath is, uh, to steward every breath as if it is your last. Like this is, this is my like every minute that God has given me, it is a gift of God. What if I treated that? What if you treated your life every minute, every afternoon, every morning and every night, like every, it was all a gift of God. Our time is short, he says, so invest it wisely. And the, the gentleman in James chapter four, he gives an example of a guy who creates a business plan. And his business plan, by the way, is pretty, it's a good business plan. He's thought of everything. Seemingly everything. He's got the win. He says, oh, today, tomorrow, where? We're gonna go to this city or that city. How long? I'm gonna spend a year there. What are you gonna do? He says, I'm gonna carry on business. Why? To make a lot of money. I mean, this is a smart guy. Like in, in our world, he would be commended for his acumen, his entrepreneurial acumen and his business planning. He's got everything. He's got all of his bases covered. But what's wrong? There's three common mistakes when using your time and thinking about your future that James tells us. Here they are. Number one, common mistake number one is we presume about tomorrow. We, we presume about tomorrow when tomorrow has not been promised to anyone. Living, knowing that your life is a vapor is very different from just normal living. When you are living, acknowledging that every minute is a blessing and my life is here today, gone tomorrow, it, it causes you to hold on to the things that matter most, that are standing. It causes you to, to savor what matters most because if all of us took an audit ourselves of our life and the way we're using our time, many of us, if we were honest with that audit, we come to the conclusion that we're pursuing things and investing time and energy into things that don't really matter. When it comes, I'm talking about in the eternal scheme of things, it's not gonna last. It's not gonna show up on the other side. It really doesn't matter. And so recognizing that our life is short and precious, every minute it causes you to see things differently and to hold on to the things that matter most. James chapter four, he, let's pick up the, in verse 14. Why you don't even know what'll happen tomorrow. You can take an educated guess or watch the stock market or news or whatever you want, but nobody knows. What is your life? You're a mist that appears a little while and then vanishes. He says, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. See, when you presume about tomorrow, he says, that's arrogant. And all such boasting is 
evil, he says. And there's two reasons why it's evil. He says, why it's a mistake. He says, one, your life is unpredictable. He said, you don't even know. We cannot predict, you guys, what's gonna happen next week. And you're not promised it. You don't know if the stock market is gonna go up or down, if the housing market, oh, there's gonna be a bubble. You watch this news, it's bad. You watch this news station, it's good. You don't know. We don't know if the war is gonna start. You don't know if like COVID's gonna disappear or, or come back in, in, with a vengeance. You don't, you, don't know, you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know if you're gonna have an accident this week. We have no assurances. There is no guarantee for perpetual success in our life. And James says, well, since life is unpredictable, you shouldn't presume upon it. You need to trust God every single day. Trust God every single day because it's unpredictable. And not only that, he says it's brief. It's, it's a, a mist, he says, that vanishes, that your life is here for a moment, just a moment. And then it's, it's gone. There's so many, in the Bible, our life is described as a mist, a vapor, a breath, a wind, a cloud, a leaf, grass on a field, a puff of smoke. Like what, what, the, what God is trying to get through to us is like, look, you're, you're one heartbeat away from eternity. You're one slip away from paralysis. You're just, you're not promised any of these, any of these things. Isaiah chapter 56 verse 12 talks about a people that, that live this way, presuming about tomorrow. Come, each one cries, let, let me get some wine. Let us drink our fill of beer, and tomorrow is just gonna be like today. Why wouldn't it be? That's what, in fact, it's even gonna be better, and this is how some of us have been living our life. We're not, we're not realizing that, God, our time is short, and every breath matters, and we're presuming about tomorrow. Psalm 31, verse 14 and 15 says, you are my God, and then he says this, my times are actually in your hands, that you know my beginning and end. You know the hairs on my head. My time is ordained before I ever lived or took a breath. You know my time, which leads to the common mistake number two, James says, planning without God. We plan without, not a single mention of God in all of this guy's planning, in his business plan. He knew what he, what he wanted to do, where he wanted to, to, to go, how he was gonna get there, but he forgot to check with God first. How many times do we do that in our planning, you guys, where we'll, we'll go ahead and enroll in the classes? We'll, 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 we'll say yes to something. We'll commit to something without even checking with God first. We've gone and filled up our schedule, filled up our calendar. We've gone and committed to things without checking in with God. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. The Bible actually encourages planning. Planning is, is something that is, is we're supposed to do and encouraged to do. The Bible teaches it, Proverbs, all over Proverbs teaches it, it, that it's foolish not to plan. So it's great to dream and it's great to have a dream for your life and it's great to plan so long as God is in them. When God is not in your planning, it is, as James says, it is a foolish scheme. It is arrogant scheming. So it's, there's nothing wrong with what he did. There's nothing wrong with planning what was wrong is that he planned without God. It wasn't wrong for, he, he wasn't wrong for what he did. He was wrong for what he did not do. Okay, look what it says, verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will. See, it's, it's sad today, really. I've met a lot of believers who love God with all their heart. But when it comes to planning about their life, about their future, about their business, about their career, they're no different from unbelievers. God is not involved in the planning process. I was speaking to someone a while back, a business owner. I love talking to, I love talking to business owners and CEOs about leadership and culture and vision and organizational stuff. It's just, I, I love doing that. So I was coaching this business owner and in the process, it kind of, just the way he was talking, I was like, Something just doesn't sound right. So I kind of, I asked him, I said, hey, you believe in God, right? Well, of course. I mean, I went to church with him. You believe in, in, in God, right? And he says, of course I believe in God. And I asked him, well, does God have a say in your business? And so I wanted to make sure we're on the level playing field here so that uh, we're, uh, the advice I'm gonna give, and, he's, and, and he was taken back by, he says, oh no, pastor, I don't let my, my faith in, in business mix. I don't think those should mix. <laughs> and and, and, and I, listen, you cannot compartmentalize your faith, 
child of God. You, God is not only the God of your Sunday, but he's the God of your Monday and your Tuesday and your Wednesday. There, you cannot separate secular and sacred. It is all God's business. All of it is God's business. Like somehow God is just in the building and just wants to be involved in your spiritual life. You know what an atheist is? An atheist is someone who denies God and lives as if he doesn't exist. Many Christians live like God doesn't exist. We're living like there is, the way that we live our life, we make our decisions, our investments, our, our businesses, and the way we manage people, all of that, all of that, it's like, like he doesn't even exist. Planning without God is practical atheism. You're, li you're living your life and planning as if God does, it does not want to be involved or is not involved in that. We're not living like the Lord is returning. We're living like we got all this time in the world and we're planning without God. And the solution here is to include God, right? In your goal setting, include God in your plan. If it is, God, here it is, it's your will. So it's, it's, what we should say is, God, help me discern what's your blessing and get under it. God, I want to I wanna help me have the discernment to, to see where you're blessing and to follow you in what you're blessing so I can be under the, the covering and the blessing of God. Instead, we pray, God, here's what I'm going to do. Bless it. By the way, I'm going to do it anyway. And James is going, hey, man, you're, don't you know God's coming back? Don't you know he's coming back? You're presuming about tomorrow. You're planning without God. And the third mistake he says is we're we're putting off doing good. That man, if we knew that our time was short, we would invest it wisely. The issue here is procrastination, delay, and postponing. Oh, I have, I have every intention to, to, to change and to, I'm just not ready. I mean, I'm, I'm planning to do that, just not right now. I mean, I'm aiming to do that. Okay, you've been aiming for, we ain't gonna pull the trigger. How long have you been aiming at that thing? How long have you been aiming to do what you, here's what he says in verse 17. If anyone, look what he says, then knows the good that they ought to do, but doesn't do it, that's a sin. So I don't know how you like categorize or would define sin. Most Christians define sin. We think of evil acts, but Christianity is more than avoiding evil. The fact is I can sin and not do anything. The Bible calls that sins of omission. I'll give you some homework. Write this down, Matthew chapter 25. I want you to go read the three parables Jesus tells in Matthew 25. And all of these parables, they all have a similar thread. The owner, God, the master, entrusted something to servants, and the servants were brought into account on a particular day or judgment day or on the return of the master, and they were not punished for any evil that they did. Every one of these, you're going to see it. They were not punished for the evil that they did. Listen, they were punished for the good they didn't do. They were not allowed, or they did not get the blessing of the master. They were not allowed to enter into the master's house. They were not, not because they did evil things. It's the good that they knew they were supposed to do and didn't do. How many of us have, I mean, we would just live different. Some of us, you already have the revelation. You know it. You know the good that God has called you to do, yet you're putting off doing it. If you live like the Lord was returning, that would be different. If you knew he's going to come back and go, what'd you do with what I gave you? Hey, what'd you do with what I told you when I told you, when I spoke that to you, when I gave you that insight and revelation, what'd you do with that? If you lived like he was actually going to come and bring that into account, you would do the good that he told you to do the moment he told you to do it. You wouldn't put it off, right? Here's the mistake in our, in our we're presuming about tomorrow, we're thinking that we got all this time and procrastination is this subtle trap. It's that someday syndrome, someday I'll, someday I'll change, someday I'll get rid of that habit, someday. Someday I'll get marriage counseling, someday. Someday I'll go to the dentist, that's mine. Someday, someday I'll go, you know, someday I'll, I'll do the whole group thing. I'll try group someday. I'm just not ready right now to do the group thing. Just someday I'll serve, get involved. Someday I'll join a church. Someday I'll tithe. Someday I'll do it. Just not, just right, not, okay. He's saying, hey, here's, here's, here's a problem. You know the good that you were supposed to do and you're not doing it. 
and you're forgetting you're a vapor and the Lord is returning soon. And if you live that way, you'd actually take what he's told you to do, the good he told you to do, you'd take it into much deeper consideration, wouldn't you? We, we would live differently. Our time is short, invest it wisely. So here, I'm gonna give you a question for every one of these to help you kind of live differently. Here's the question that you need to ask yourself. Do I know and am I living God's purpose for my life? That would cause you to live differently because everything else revolves around the purpose of God, the will of God. Do I know and am I living God's purpose for my life? Because time is short and I need to invest it wisely in doing what God has called me to do, not in what I want to do. Okay? So here's, I know, it's all James, I promise. It's not me, I love you, it's James. No, I'm just kidding. Number two, here's the second thing. If you wanna live like the Lord is returning, he says, James says, our possessions are not our own, so steward them accordingly. Our possessions are not our own. Okay, so, so here's the shift that we need to make. Um, because the Lord is returning, you need to stop acting like you're the owner and recognize you're the manager. Because God is the one who owns it all. I believe it's in Psalm 89, verse 11. It's not in your notes. It says, the heavens are the Lord's and the earth is the Lord's and everything on the earth belongs to the Lord. So, so all of it is God's. God, and what God does is he just kind of leases it to us for a certain amount of time. He'll, he'll, put, he'll loan you some stuff, for, but you can't take it with you like you can't. You're, all the stuff, you, you ain't taking it with you in eternity. Someone else is gonna get all that stuff. Gonna, gonna, it's gonna pass down. He loans it for you or leases. So you are not the owner of anything. And in, in a lot of the parables that Jesus told, it was with this perspective that, that there were servants. Another one is Matthew chapter 21. It's again, not your notes, some more homework for you guys. If you wanna read the parable of the evil farmers, I believe it was, where the, where the master, the owner of a vineyard entrusted, leased the vineyard to some people and went away. And then when it was harvest time, he sent some service to go collect part of the harvest because it's my field. And, and the owner, God says, because that's my field. I get, I get a portion of that. And they killed the servant. And they kept killing the servant. And then the owner said, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. They won't treat my son bad. And what do you think they did? They killed the son. And so this, this was a, a parable that shows us how the people of God treated the prophets and treated the son, Jesus. But it's also a parable that every one of us need to take notice that Jesus, that God has entrusted to us, leased things to us. And then he's asked us to steward them well. And some of us are acting like we are owners instead of managers. We act like it's ours. And God said, it, it, you need to live like the Lord is returned. Your possessions are not your own. You are the, that's the, the biblical word is steward. It means manager. It means you're managing something that is not your own for somebody else. Everything you are managing for God, for God, for his glory, for his kingdom. Everything he's given you for his glory, for his kingdom. That's what, that's what we steward. There's four key issues that James gives us. In, in this time, of James writing the New Testament church, there was no middle class. There was just have and have nots. There were the very rich and the very poor and the system that was set up in that time, it like supported the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer. So that there was a lot of persecution to poor people. And so uh, James writes a stern rebuke in James chapter five. Now four key issues with wealth. Here's what he says. Number one, he says, don't hoard it. You're supposed to steward it not hoard it. That's not yours. You can't hoard it. And by the way, when I say hoard and James says hoard in the scripture, he's not talking about setting aside savings. That's not what he's talking about because that's actually, the Bible agrees with that. That's a wise investment of and a wise use of your resources is to put some aside into some savings. That's, that's for a lot of great reasons. Hoarding refers to getting more and more simply for the sake of getting more. Like stashing away more just for the sake of stashing away more, every now and then someone will pass away, like an elderly person, and then they'll find thousands of dollars rat holed and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars rat holed away, just, just hoarding it. And that is not what God gave you those resources to steward, not to tuck them away and bury your talents. Here's what James chapter five says. Now listen, you rich people, that's you, by the way. You guys are all rich, richer than you know. Look at the rest of the world. You, my friends, are rich. You rich people, weep and well because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moss have eaten your clothes. 
Look at the rot. Your gold and silver are corroded. He says it's rotted and corroded because anything you just accumulate will deteriorate. That's, that's the principle here. If you're just accumulating, it is deteriorating. You're not leveraging it, stewarding it for God's kingdom or his glory. It is just deteriorating. You just bury the talents. And that corrosion, here's what he says, that corrosion, that deterioration of the stuff you're hoarding is actually testifying against you. It's eating away at your flesh, your life, he says. You've hoarded wealth in the last days, here's what he said. You forgot that the Lord is coming. You forgot and you put it away. You buried it, you're rat holing it. My goodness, now again, save it, yes, but goodness, leverage that for his kingdom and his glory. Don't hoard it. Wealth is to be used, not hoarded. To be used for his kingdom and his glory. Don't hoard it. Then secondly, he says, don't steal it. You're to steward it, don't steal it. And that's where some of you are like, oh, thank God, there's one that I don't do. <laughs> Whew. Okay, here's what James says, though. Now, there's a, there's a lot of different ways that you can make money dishonestly. And one of the ways you can, you can make money is just by not paying your debts. Because here's, here's the decision-making process that some of you have already made. If I don't pay that bill, I could get that. If I just let my credit card just whatever and just do that, then I could, just, I could do this. And, and, and so James is going to broaden what stealing means for us today. Verse 4, he says, look, the wages you failed to pay. So there, you were supposed to pay, and you didn't. You were supposed to pay those workers who mowed your fields. They're crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. So it's, it's, stealing is not just taking like what doesn't belong to you. Sometimes it's not giving what belongs to someone else. Okay, so like you charge too much for something is a form of stealing. You're a used car salesman and you sold a car for way more than it was worth and you didn't tell them about the accident that got, it got into. That's stealing. That's a form of stealing. Or, or maybe you cheat on your taxes. Or you, you get paid hourly and you waste time at work. Like you waste time, like you get coffee, you take the breaks, you don't do anything, yet you expect to be paid for that hour as if you were working and you were not working. And the Bible says, well, you're no better than that crooked employer. You are stealing wages, okay? So James says, don't, don't steal it. Live like the Lord is returning and steward every minute, every time. Here's, here's the third thing he says, hey, don't waste it. This is the one that gets a lot. I mean, this is so tempting, right? One of the greatest temptations is that we must avoid with our wealth, regardless of the amount, is to spend it selfishly all on ourselves, on, on what we want, what I, you know, because, hey, man, I deserve it, right? I worked for it. I earned it. I, I'm worth it. Or here, how about this one? I can afford it. Why not? Listen, just because you can afford it doesn't mean you should have it. Now, look, I'm not saying you can't have nice things. Dude, I like nice things just as much as the next person. God, I'm not saying you can't have nice things, but God is saying that those aren't your nice things. Those aren't your things. Stop acting like it belongs to you. It's not yours. The resources you're using for it or the, what you are brought, like it's not yours. Everything belongs to God. My possessions are not my own. I need to steward them accordingly. Verse five, he says, you've lived on earth in luxury, you've just become so self-indulgent, just figuring out how to feed yourself, do for yourself, and you're not living like the Lord is returning. You fatten yourself up on the day of slaughter, like there is going to be an account, and you're just living in luxury instead of leveraging, you're wasting. You're wasting it. And then he says, lastly, don't abuse it. Don't abuse it. Steward it. See, wealth gives you so much more than buying ability. Wealth gives you influence. Wealth gives you power. Wealth gives you authority. See, why, why do people pay more attention to when a rich person talks over when a poor person talks? Okay, I'm not saying it's right. It's absolutely wrong. But in this fallen world that is dark and crooked itself, people value and will listen. Having wealth comes with it a certain amount of power or authority in this fallen world. And you can use that. Listen to me, you that are, you got some wealth here. Some of you are you got some wealth. And so you can use that for evil or you can use it for good. You can use it for your selfish gains 
Or you can use it for the glory of God in his kingdom. You can use that power and influence. Don't abuse it, James says. Verse 6, you've condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not even opposing you. Evidently, rich people, they were buying off judges in their time. So if they wanted to take advantage of someone, they would just take them to court and slip the judge some bills and they would get their own way. And many people today, they, they use wealth to get their own way. They know they have power and influence, so they manipulate people with it. They'll control people with it. They know that, that they have a little power and authority, so they'll use it to manipulate and control people. So here's the question. If you want to live like the Lord is returning and stop you know, treating your possessions and stuff like it's yours and start stewarding those things, here's the question you ask yourself. How can I be a blessing with my blessing. See, that's why God gave you the resources in the first place. He blessed you so that you can be a blessing. The Lord is returning. Let's live our life. Let's invest our time like it. Let's use our resources like it. And then lastly, number three, he says, our trials are temporary, so wait patiently. Our trials are temporary. Like the Lord is returning. I know it's hard. I know it's, hey, just wait though. He's coming to set the record straight. Hey, I know it feels like you're, it's, it's, you're be, we're being done wrong and this isn't right and this is this and this, and this. I get it, I get it. Instead of taking it in your own hands, wait patiently. Jesus is coming back and he's gonna bring everything into account and bring everything into order. He's coming back. Don't you, don't take it in your own hands. Wait patiently. Second Corinthians chapter four, not in your handouts, but here's, the Lord told me that some of you are, are losing heart because of the trial and the trouble of the season, like it feels like things are coming back on track and then boom, hit. And this is going good and then boom, hit. And I just felt like the Lord told me some of you are losing heart and he wants, he wants to inject some heart into you, some confidence into you today. Here's what he says, therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly, it's, we're wasting away. There's all kinds of stuff happening outwardly, but inwardly, listen, God wants something different to happen. Like that inward, you, inwardly, you would not reflect what's happening outwardly. Like inwardly, something else, it could be out here wasting away. It's crazy, it's chaotic, it's COVID, it's up and down, it's this and that. But inwardly, you're different. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. He says, for our light and momentary troubles. Again, hey, think big picture, guys. He's coming back. He's gonna set the record straight. The, the return is gonna, it's just momentary. It's light. I know it feels like forever, but we're not promised even tomorrow. These are light and momentary troubles are achieving for us in eternal glory that far outweighs them are. Uh, our trials are temporary, so wait patiently. All of us spend a great percentage of our time waiting. Much of our time, we're gonna spend waiting. Some of you are waiting to graduate high school. Then, then it's waiting to get your degree. Then it's waiting for a promotion. Then it's waiting for, the, you're just, we're just, we're constantly like waiting. Feel like we're in this waiting period of life. Our trials are temporary, so wait patiently in three circumstances. Here they are. Number one, wait patiently, he says, when circumstances are uncontrollable. When circumstances, a lot of life is beyond our control, you guys. Whether you realize that or not, and James uses the farmer as an example in verse seven. He says, be, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. He says, hey, you too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. See, farming requires a lot of patience. There is no like overnight crops. The major job, the major part of the job of a farmer is waiting. Yeah, he's got to till and he's got to plant and he's got to prune and harvest and all that stuff. But most of his job is, is uncontrollable. The farmer can't control the weather, can't control like the soil to an extent. He can't control the sun. He can't control the economy. He can't... It, in, in this end of the world, Palestine, it's not the best conditions to be a farmer, okay? And sometimes it's not, you're just not in the best conditions. And the fact is, even when we know something is uncontrollable, we still try to control it, don't we? You know how we try to control the uncontrollable? By worrying about it. When you worry about something, that's your attempt inwardly to control the situation. 
It's your attempt to, to, to make sense of it. And if I just think about it, and what, is, what if this, and what if that, I'm gonna plan for this and plan for that and this. And it's your worrying is an attempt to control the uncontrollable. And, and James is going, look, just be patient. Just wait patiently when circumstances are uncontrollable because you can either worry while you wait or you can worship while you wait, but you can't do both. You cannot worry and worship at the same time. And James is going, look, man, and when you're in trial, you're in trouble, if things are out of your control, you got to wait patiently. Here's the second one. He says, wait patiently when people are unchangeable. How many of you got some people that wish they would change in your life? Come on, how many of you brought them to church? No, I'm just kidding. There's, <laughs> we got people that, that like, man, if you just fix his brain, Jesus, just fix his mind. Changes, you know, if you just fix this part, oh man, life would be so much better. James goes, hey, when people are unchangeable, you got to wait patiently. You can't be, you can't force it, manipulate it. You can't, some of you are undergoing a trial of relation, like, because people are difficult and not changing. James says in verse nine, he continues, he says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, are you going to be judged? The judge is standing at the door. Again, he's saying, how, here, he's coming. He's at the door. He's standing near. He's coming. Stop, stop taking it in your own hands, brothers and sisters. As an example of patience in the face of suffering, he gives us an example. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. The duty of the prophets were to get people to change their ways, to get them to turn back to God. They had a belief problem, a behavior problem. They said, hey, no, you got to do it differently. The, the problem was people resist change. All kinds of change, even good change. People will always resist change, even what's good for them. They'll resent you for suggesting it, for suggesting a change that is good for them. And the result for the prophets were they were maligned, they were misunderstood, they were persecuted, they were criticized, they were always unpopular, they always had the discouraging news. And the Bible says, be patient when people are unchangeable. That word patient in, in the Greek, it's macrothumia. Thumia coming from thermometer. And here's what it, it literally means. It takes a long time to get you hot. That's what that means when he says, hey, be patient when people are unchangeable. He's saying, look, you need, some of you got too short of a fuse, man. You, it gets lit and you're ready to blow up. He says, no, 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 macrothumia, macro. You need a, you need a, a, a longer fuse on your life if you're going to be successful with people, you got to learn to be patient. If you're going to be a good parent or a successful parent, you got to learn to be patient. You have to. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, that love chapter, the first characteristic of love, he says, love is patient. And it's the same word, macrothumia. It means long-fused. Love, love is long-fused. It has a long fuse. It's not easy to anger. It is not irritable. Be patient with difficult people. Here's the third one, he says. Hey man, you gotta be, wait patiently when problems are unexplainable. And there's a lot of that as well, especially right now. You got a lot of things. You're like, why is this happening, God? Why again? Why, why me? Why, why, why my job? Why, why, why COVID? Why this? Why? Like it's in, we're, we want answers. We, we want like, there's, they're unexplainable. In jo James chapter five, verse 11, he says, as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of, and then he gives the example of Job's perseverance. If, how many are reading the one-year Bible with us? We, I read the one-year Bible, and I always encourage people to read the one-year Bible with me. We're in the story of Job right now, and Job was in the Super Bowl of suffering. This dude won the championship of suffering, man. He was the wealthiest, he was the wealthiest man of his time. He was a believer in God, but in two short days, he lost everything. His, his kids were killed, his wealth was gone, his health, it was an incurable disease. And if that wasn't, wasn't bad enough, his wife took the cake, man. His, listen, his wife came to him and said, why don't you curse God and die already, Job? Oh my goodness, this chick, you know what I mean? What a Proverbs 31 woman right here, man. A real support system. But the worst, the worst part was really that Job had no explanation. For 37 chapters, he's like, uh, like he was a good man. 
He, he, he was very generous and very loving and very kind. And he, he was good to his kids and good to people. He always lending. And he was just, he loved God and worshiped God and honored God. And like for like 37 chapters here, it's like nothing. There is no reason at all. Yet Job persevered. He hung in there. He refused to give up. Listen to me. Life is not fair. You will not always get the explanation of why things happen the way they happen. Listen, listen to me. And God doesn't owe you one. He does not owe you an explanation of why things happen when they happen. There is injustice. Sometimes we can't figure out the reason why our problems, but God says there are three reasons why you can trust me anyway. Three reasons. Let me close with this. Number one, because God is in control. God is in control. Here's, here's the cool, like three times throughout this section of scripture, the, James is saying, the Lord is coming back. The Lord is coming back. Why is he doing that? Because it's the ultimate proof that God is in control. History is his story. I'm moving toward this climactic conclusion that God has already written. Everything is on schedule. God has a plan and a purpose. And one day Jesus will return and he will come soon. Verse, verse eight, again, in the Phillips translation, he said, so you must be patient. Resting your hearts, look at this, on this ultimate certainty. Man, this is a certainty. God, like the Lord's coming is very near. God is in control. James's point is, although the situation may be out of your control, it's never out of God's control. Look, this God, he's already written it. He already knows it. He is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is in control. And you can trust him with everything in the middle. God's timing is perfect. God is never late. He is worthy of your trust. He is worthy of your trust. God is in control. The second reason why you can trust God is because he's a rewarder of your patience. Look, when God comes back, when Jesus comes back, he's not like coming back to spank you or discipline you or be mean to you or like, Aaron, this is what you did. No, 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 no. What he's going to do, listen to me, what he's going to do is reward you for your life. That's what he's doing. The, I call it the two-question test. I don't got time to show you in the scripture, but the first question you're gonna get at, get, going to get asked in eternity is, what did you do with my son, Jesus? That's it. And if you have the right answer, I, I made him the Lord of my life is the only answer. It's not, I went to church, I heard about him, I studied him, none of that will do. I knew about him, no, no, no. It's he was my Lord and the savior of my life. Answer that question, come on in, you're in heaven now. Then there's a second question that, that is the one we're talking about today where God goes, what'd you do with what I gave you? And, and that's not an answer that's going to give you punishment. That is an answer that's going to give you blessing. He wants to reward you for what you did when he loaned it to you, when he leased it to you. Every breath, every time, every opportunity, every gift, he wants to reward you. In verse 11, again, he says, as you know, we count it blessed those who have persevered. So when, listen, when you want to get angry, when you want to worry, when you want to take matters into your own hands, and, and when you want to get distracted, you ask yourself this question, is it worth you forfeiting your blessing? Is it worth it? Is it worth you forfeiting the blessing of God that is coming to you if you just wait patiently instead of taking control? Okay, God is in control. God, God wants to reward you and will reward your patience. And then the third reason is that God is working things out. A lot of times it's behind the scenes, but you know, for a scattered people that's, that's under persecution, lots of distraction, norms have been kind of messed up because we've just been all over the place. Now, here's, here's what James goes, no, 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 God is working. It may not look like God is in this and God, no, God is working things out. Verse 11, end of that section, he says, you have heard of Job's per perseverance. And look what he says, and you've seen what the Lord finally brought about. Job got twice as blessed as he had everything before. You've seen God's faithfulness. You've seen it, how he brought everything out because the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. God's delays are not denials. While you're waiting, God is working often in ways that we cannot see right now. So here's the question that you gotta ask yourself. If you wanna live like the Lord is returning, ask yourself, am I trusting God in my trials? Like in the trouble that I'm experiencing, in the scattering, in the persecution, in the uncertainty, in the difficulty, am I truly, or am I, am I trying to control it? Or am I waiting patiently, trusting God in the middle of my trial? Amen. Before you click your binders and all that, can you just put your heads down real quick? 
let me pray for you. Let me pray for you because you're here today and you're here on purpose. There is, this is always such a, a good reminder, a good reminder for some of you that the Lord's coming is near. And some of you have been living with every head bowed, every eye closed. Some of you have been living as if you're an unbeliever. Like you love God, you love him, but he's just not involved in your life anymore. Maybe he was at one point, but he's not involved in your planning. He's not involved in your decisions. He's not involved in your finances. He's not involved in your business. You kind of just have relinquished your religiosity to a coming to church thing instead of being Lord of your life thing. And you need to come back. James is calling out from the pages of scripture saying, the Lord's coming is near. Come on, use your time wisely. Those possessions and wealth isn't yours. Steward them accordingly. He's coming back. Hey, in these trials you're enduring, it's 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 not forever. It's not forever. Wait patiently, because the Lord is bringing all things into account. With every head bowed and eye closed, maybe some of you need to come back. You need to heed the scripture and just come on back to this place of Jesus being in control of your life. Maybe some of you never made that decision ever, and that's actually what salvation is. It's when you let Jesus take control. It's not when you decide to go to church or when you want to do better and fix things. That's not Christianity, man. This isn't like a a fix-it course. He wants to be Lord of your life. He wants to be Lord. And the way you do that is you surrender the control of everything, every part, your time, your treasure, your trouble, your Sunday, your Monday, your Friday, your Saturday. Just let him have it all. That's what salvation is. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. That's it. God will begin that work inside of you right here, right now. Some of you need to make that decision for the first time. Others of you need to make it again. You need to come back. Because you, the scattering thing, the distraction thing, just it's like you're living like you don't even know him anymore. And you need to surrender again. Come on back home. If that's you, I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out or anything. I just want to pray with you right there, right where you're seated. With every head bowed and eye closed, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna count to three. At the count of three, with every head bowed and eye closed, I just want you to lift that hand up. If you say, that's it, I surrender. Whether it's the first time or you need to do it again today, today's the day. Come on, one, two, three, be bold. I surrender, I surrender, I'm coming back. Yes, 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 all over this place. Leave it up, leave it up, yes, 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 yes. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, 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 yes, all over, yeah, yeah, yeah. Leave it up for me, yeah, good job, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you, God, all over this place and online too. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you, can I help you with the words now just to pray, to say something like this? And honestly, God is more concerned with your heart than he is with your words. But let me help you with some words to say to make Jesus your Lord. Simple as this, just say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins, my past, my mistakes, everything. Today, I surrender my life to you. Come on, tell him, I give you control of everything. I'm all yours, and I'm going all in. Come live inside of me, Jesus. Change me from the inside out. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, I pray over every person right now that we would live different, that we would live like you were returning, that we would not get comfortable, that we would not get complacent, that we would not live indifferent, but that we would have a holy anticipation that you are coming back. God, in the way that we use our time, God, help us to be wise and redeem every day, every breath, the gift that you've given us today, tomorrow. It's not promised. God, help us use our time wisely. God, we recognize that we're not the owner of anything, that you are, and you've loaned us, leased us, that we are stewards in this life. Help us to steward the resources, to leverage them, God, not to hoard it, to abuse it, to steal it, not to, not any of those, God, but to leverage it for your kingdom and your glory. But you've given it to us. You bless me to be a blessing, God. Help me be a blessing with what you've given me. And every trial and every trouble and everything I'm enduring right now, help me to endure it patiently, Lord. Not to take control, not to lose heart, not to be afraid, not to, not to give up or give in, but to trust you in these light and momentary troubles. Because you're coming back. <laughs> you're in control. You're working it all out, God. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen.
Amen.